did play with Hendrix for a while, so that's <laughs> feedback. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Farron. Uh, I'm a host for MLB Network Radio with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Really thrilled to be uh, uh, moderating this panel today on Data Flow, as Scott said. Uh, introduce the gentleman uh, to my right, uh, right next to me, the uh, Vice President of Research for Sports Info Solutions, Joe Rosales. Uh, Matt May Idol, heartthrob, uh, star of television and uh, internet, uh, Mike Petriello from MLB.com, who uh, works on the StatCast information, and uh, all the way on the end on the right, the uh, owner and founder of Driveline Baseball, Kyle Bodie. And, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about information, and I think probably uh, a lot about technology, as that's been, the, as many of you know, one of the big changes. And um, as I, I'm going to start with so many players have come now through the collegiate ranks where tech and data was more readily available and are maybe more aligned to it than, say, the people that are coaching them and instructing them at this point. Joe, I'll start with you. Just what's the biggest thing in trying to get coaches up to speed on information, whether it be statistical data or technological data? So... Um I mean, to a certain degree, I can, uh, I'll speak sort of mainly from the perspective of, uh, you know, what we've had to deal with as a company with, in ba you know, at Baseball Info Solutions. Um, and, you know, that uh, has mainly entailed, you know, so most of our interactions are with the front office, with the analysts, and, 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 you know, in terms of being able to translate that information to the coaching staff to get them up to speed on things, it's, uh, to a certain degree, it's, um, you know, we, we just have to sort of try to facilitate what, you know, the build the best tools, the most digestible tools, the kinds of things that are going to be sort of easily understandable and presentable to um, some of the staff that aren't necessarily going to be as uh, familiar um, with some of these advanced statistics and analytics. And again, just sort of trying to, to, to put it together in a way that's going to be digestible. Now, the, the, the one thing that's, that is good is that um, sometimes, you know, there have been certain instances where um, you know, as it it's becomes clear that there's more and more information out there and there's more and more things to do with the analytics and with the statistics and, and that, you know, you're if you're not using them, you're going to start falling behind. The coaches themselves, to a certain degree, you know, uh, start getting curious, um, in, again, in certain instances. I mean, there's, there's you know, one team uh, for which um, in the past we, uh, when we had our meetings with them, it was the analyst and their... Um, mm. Their coach in charge of infield positioning, for instance, to uh, or um, you know other instances where we don't necessarily have a direct line to the coach, but it's clear that they're thinking about things. They're using our data. They um, start having questions about how, what that means. They ask their front office staff. They relay it to us. And um, so that's while those aren't the typical experience, there those are starting to happen a little bit more often. And I think just in terms of being able to get them. Um, you know, to to that point, I think it. I think it's yeah, mainly just uh, to a certain degree getting them, getting the data in front of them, starting with with some some more sort of straightforward, digestible things, and, and get them thinking about things, and then they start asking them more sophisticated questions. Kyle, you have more boots on the ground in terms of working with players. What are you able to take from what you do, and I think probably more specifically with the technology, that you can say, hey, listen, we've tested this, we understand how it works, and put it into um, a uh, uh, manner that coaches can understand to be able to translate to a player. Yeah, a big part of what we do, and uh, our quantitative analysts like Alex Caravan and Dan O'Coin do a really good job of validating uh, the work that we do. So we can produce changes, whether it's in fastball velocity or movement or spin, uh, and then we can actually validate like using actual, you know, saber metrics and the whole idea that we should really care if this data is valid, if the changes are relevant. And so we'll use technology like TrackMan or Rapsodo, uh, Kinetrax, uh, our biomechanics lab. Um, and uh, a quick story, uh, like how we got it to be evident to the coaches is uh, uh, Andrew Friedman, when he was at the Rays, told me kind of the best way to make an impact uh, is to empower the players and have them bubble up through the systems because it'll actually force the remainder of the organization to like really care. Rather than a top-down approach, you have people organically adapting uh, and adopting these technologies and um, demanding it at the highest level. And I think that's where you see the greatest success at the uh, professional level. Mike, with that in mind, I mean, we have players and coaches to some degree that are learning at the same time. So is that a positive? Like, how do we, how do you 
kind of work that together so that they're, they, I mean, they're all in the same boat learning together, right? You know, some of them are. I mean, I think you've seen a real sea change just in the hiring practices of teams. Like, you know, half of Kyle's guys now work for teams because <laughs> they can speak to the data, but also, you know, in a different way than I could. Like, I'm not going to go up to a guy and say, okay, change your curveball grip and this is how it feels because I don't have that playing background. But a lot of these guys do, even if it's not professionally, you know, at some level. Uh, so I think that's a big deal. And I also think what you're seeing is, it's just not as scary as it used to be. Like, let's say even five years ago, if you wanted to get some of this really interesting data, you either had to know where to look, like on fan graphs, or you had to actually be able to write code. And now if you look at some of this stuff, it's visually appealing. Like the, the interface of the Rapsodo, it's actually cool looking. It looks right. like a video game. You know, Baseball Savant, which we work on, it's colorful. You know, there's team logos, and it's, it's something you can look at and not feel overwhelmed if you are trying to do this without having like a master's degree. And I think that's been a huge change, and it's made it easier both for younger guys coming up and some of the older coaches trying to figure it out. You write a lot of public-facing articles, and so you have to be cognizant of language, right, in trying to make sure that whatever, no matter how complicated the idea is, that you're trying to make it simple enough that, a, that an audience that may not have as much time invested in analysis can understand it readily. What are the keys to that? in your mind that, that maybe would translate in a player coach or front office coach dynamic? Try to keep it in plain English, I guess. I mean, you're right, that's, that's the hardest part of my job is like knowing that I'm writing to an audience that uh, a large portion of them still like thinks RBIs are the coolest thing in the world. You know, and a lot of the players and coaches come from that background. And I don't think you can go to a player or, or even a coach, you know, unless it's like Daniel Murphy or somebody and say, you know, I really think you need to, you know, change your laminar flow, like you gotta be able to speak to them in a way that <laughs> baseball players can understand. You know, like, if you change this, we think that your batting average against will drop by 20 points and maybe you'll make four million more dollars next year. Like, you keep it as simple as that. I don't think they need to know, like, all of the actual, like, intense science that went behind it. And as you see more and more players buy into this and gain success, like, the first wave was, like, you know, Murphy and Turner and Donaldson. Now every team's got, like, five relievers who suddenly throw ridiculous sliders because they've learned how to use this. And I think that's where you're really seeing things change because they see other players finding success with it. You know, Kyle and Mike mentioned Rap Soto. Um, obviously, we've seen them. They're, they're fairly ubiquitous now all of a sudden, right? I think they have contracts with 29 of the 30 teams coming into spring training. Uh, we're starting to see, I think Mike, Mike did a pretty good job of chronicling how many Edutronic cameras were behind bullpen sessions, right? At least the, the, the uh, uh, super slow motion cameras. Um, you know, you mentioned Kinetrax tracks and all this. What, at what point... For, as somebody who was on the outside and on the cutting edge of using this, did you start to see the tipping point where teams were like, wait a second, we're behind if we're not in on this? It's this year. Mike and I were just talking about it right before the panel, and we talked about it on Twitter. Um, I'm not really sure which one of us said it, but today, like, using technologies like Rapsodo and Edutronic are just required. Like, that's not getting ahead. Um, and it's just, you know, it's table stakes. So this year, what I've seen in working the contracts that I have at this fields is this is the first year that it's just not, uh, it's just normal. Like, it's here, and it's not going away and the coaches are gonna to have to adapt to that. So this is definitely the first year I've seen widespread uh, adoption of technology. And I told Mike, I, I didn't think I'd see it until I was 40, I'm 35 now. And uh, it's just truly amazing. You know, it's good for us, it's good for the industry. Obviously we've had, I think eight or so employees kind of poached my teams, which is, I now know how the Oakland A's feel and the Houston Astros. Um, but like that's that's good because it challenges us to get better, and it's how we hired our director of hitting, who's now with the Phillies uh, and still working for us as the coordinator, rolling out that technology, which that would have been unthinkable five years ago in any organization, much less uh, Philadelphia. I also think it's cool. I'm gonna jump in over here, Mike. That the way players are talking about it just seems to have changed. Like when I wrote that thing about how many teams are using it, I kind of aggregated a lot of quotes from some of our beat writers. And uh, Wade LeBlanc, who's like you know a decent mm -hmm. lefty in Seattle camp, he's like, yeah. I've a couple years ago, I would have never thought about this, but I'm an average pitcher, and I want to be better, and this might be the way to do it. Like Alex Cobb said, it was, it was hocus pocus when he was younger, and now it's like, these are how guys are improving. I just think that's cool. It's like, it's a tool to make yourself better, uh, and it's a very, you know, complicated tool, but it's a tool in the same way, you know, radar guns used to be a tool. Yeah. I, I mean, I find the same thing is, is happening in, in camps. We're talking, I'm bringing up the tech question a lot with players, because I think, you know, we're trying to educate an audience on what's going on in in terms of what's happening in the field, and players are all buying in. And Joe, for years, players felt like the data and the stats were working against them, right? Because so much of it was used in player evaluation that they felt right. or their agencies felt like it was working against them. When did right. you, or have you noticed a change? When did that happen where it was like, wait a second, this is important stuff that I know how we can get better. Yeah, well, so um, 
and this is actually what I was just thinking about as, as these guys were speaking, like, I think that there's a big difference between, you know, so up until now, a lot of um, analytics has been sort of based on these, you know, these metrics that have been getting more and more complex. So when you're trying to mm -hmm. convey something to a player or to a coach called WOBA or WRC Plus, and it has all of these various components and complicated, you know, formulas and that kind of thing, like that's it. Like then it just it feels like all right, the nerds are coming and trying to tell me what to do, and I can't really understand this. So like, you know, let's just play baseball. Whereas now, if you're actually providing, you know, with all these technology, you're actually providing them things that they that they can see and and um, and sort of understand to a certain degree. If if you know where instead of um, just sort of evaluational, like, you know, players with better WOBAs are the guys that you should be trying to sign as a team. Like, now it's like, all right, well, you know, these guys have this type of spin rate, but, like, if we focus on that, we um, we can work with them and they can the, they can understood, sort of understand, uh, okay, if I can see that and that's something that correlates well with performance and if I can work on that and improve that, uh, like, I think that's where some of it's starting to connect a little bit more with uh, with some of the, the you know, on-field staff and, and the players. If, if you were to look, I guess, Kyle, I'll start with you. I'm going to hear from all three of you, though, on this. This Just in terms of, like, okay, trying to learn the technology. Somebody who tried to learn it. In fact, I think, Kyle, we talked in the in a casino <laughs> in Vegas, which is where most of our conversations happen. Um, but the, 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 uh, just about, like, trying to learn all this information, what all of these things are, if you're behind in the curve, is like, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, right? So like if you were to say, all right, here's the way you get up to speed and putting it together in manageable bites, how would you suggest that? How would you kind of structure something to say, okay, here's what you need to do first, second, third, to at least have a working understanding of what's going on to be able to either, you know, as an organization or a fan, be able to, to see where this is going next or have an understanding of where it's going next? I, yeah, I think, uh, I think we can't, understate like how good of a job um, like fan graphs and sites like beyond the box score who have written really good primers on just saber metrics in general which I think is a good understanding just thinking about like quantitative understanding of baseball specifically and the foundation of how runs are created um, and just understanding things like base runs is really important from understanding the technology so rather than focusing on what's the flashiest thing or what does spin rate mean or all this other stuff. It's more about um, like how, let's understand how baseball is modeled from a first principles perspective and then let's look about, well, what does this technology tell me and word it in a way that a scout can understand. I'm, I'm of the belief that the old school scouts are going to be still very valuable down the line and are more valuable today than they ever have been, which I know is a competing theory with um, some of the major league teams who are cutting staff. Uh, and so my opinion is like we need to go to them to explain it's to be to be frank it's their game it's not ours like it's their, that's the history of the tradition of the game is 100 to 150 years of that type of thinking and to dismiss it offhand is kind of a rough tough scene so it's rather just to like talk to them about talk to them in their language like Mike said uh, and Joe said and go to them and start with that and like here's the quantitative understanding it actually validates a lot of what you think but it's just a more kind of uh, logical way to think about things and I've found if you explain it that way even the most old school people can really appreciate that you know they're not going to buy into the intricacies of it just like some of us won't buy into some of the eye test stuff but that doesn't mean that we can't agree on the core principles of how baseball is modeled. Mike from your standpoint? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely true. I mean, there's not a one-size-fits-all way to do any of this, you know, kind of like Kyle was just saying. Like, you can't, like, one of the, I think the more interesting things that I've seen you talk about is a lot of this stuff has just sort of proven some of the old stuff. Like, obviously not all of it. There are some old school things that never made sense and right. currently don't, but like you said, a lot of it is just like, you know, some of the stuff that you always told us was true and we were never really sure about, as numbers say, like, they're kind of true. I mean, it's not about, you know, throwing out everything that used to be and saying, now this is the right way. It's about just trying to come at it from a slightly more educated perspective. And, you know, it's, it's cool because 10 years ago, to, for me anyway, this stuff was about team building. It would be like, I don't care that this guy hit 280, he's got no power, he can't play defense, get this guy who hit 240. Like, that's what, you know, saver metrics was like 10 years ago. Now it's not finding guys. Everybody can find good players. It's about improving them, right? right? That's, that is like the huge sea change to me, and that's what I find most interesting. Yeah, how about from you, Joe, on that? Um, so... Um, all right, actually, I just lost my train of thought. What was, what was well, we, we, we were, we were talking about just kind of like what, what are the basics that you would say to getting people up to speed on where we are now? Right, okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, again, I think they're, they're, what these guys have been saying are, is obviously right. And then we even, you know, sort of to a certain degree, um, 
you know, if you, if some of you guys, if you saw the presentation that was given yesterday by Andrew Kine in terms of, you know, our, like for instance, are our, our trying to, to um, convey our defensive metrics and make sure that people buy into that because that's one of those things that, that a lot of people have uh, been skeptical of over the years is, is those defensive metrics. But if we can kind of show, um, you know, we built in that uh, consideration now for, for balls being close to the wall being more difficult and therefore those, uh, you know, should be sort of um, baked into the calculation a little bit, you know, more specifically. And like when you can show that, uh, that we're, we are considering, you know, those little things that are intuitive to, 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 to people, to, you know, people in the baseball community that, yeah, um, that it is being accounted for the fact that, like, if this, if guy has to go up against the wall, but sometimes he's jumping, he has to, you know, he can't necessarily run through a ball the way he would if he had acres of space around him, like, now it makes sense. And, and the fact that these guys are, are, are being able to evaluate um, that based on those factors, you know, you, you trade, you, again, it's, it's sort of, being able to kind of, if you can tie it to, to, to concepts people are aware of, show them video clips that, that, that make it make sense, like, you know, I think that's, that's how that generally works for us. If, if you have questions, by the way, for the panel, there are note cards in the back, I think Jeff has them, right, or, or passing them around, so you can go ahead and write them, they'll come up here and we'll bring it, but I think, I think you hit on something here in that, you know, let's say I run into as a broadcaster, right, numbers can bog down the conversation, and it's not because people don't understand, you know, some of the, the, what the concepts are or anything like that. It's just when, like if you're listening to the radio and all of a sudden somebody starts going through exactly what the gross domestic product is and starts getting down to the decimal points, you're just gonna zone out, right? Like it just is not, it's not the way the mind works. So like when you are trying to pass these ideas along, how do you do it without actually using the statistical information or the data? I guess it's easier with some of the data stuff, right? Because like, like Mike said, Rapsodo is a cool toy. Like that stuff is really neat. Like that works well on television, right? Well, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about some of the, uh, the younger guys coming up. Like if you're a rookie this year, you were probably born, I don't know, 97, 98. <laughs> that means, you know, you were 10 years old when the iPhone came out. Like you were so used to this. And I think I've heard from a lot of players and coaches saying they almost demand it. You know, it's like if they go somewhere and they, you don't have that kind of information for them, they're sort of wondering what's up because they're hearing from their friends. They're seeing, you know, cool toy, I guess, is kind of a too simplistic way to say it, but it's sort of true. You know, like if you can look at this visually appealing thing and sort of have fun with it and in the meantime improve your career, like that's what's, what's really happening right now. Yeah, I, and I'm, I always, I feel like tech relates cow better to people because it's, because like Mike said, I mean, people like cool toys, right? Like they, they like that better. So as you've worked with players, and introduce them more to technology, have they grasped a better understanding of the statistical elements behind it, or have they just had an understanding? I guess really what they need to do is are, are understand the concepts that make the stats work, right? Yeah, there's, there's very few college players and pro players who care about uh, the validity of the data, <laughs> but like, you know, we're, 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 caught, uh, we're caught in an interesting kind of middle ground where uh, I'm a stickler uh, for validity and reliability of both the technology on the market uh, as well as existing metrics, like do they actually describe what they say they describe? Uh, it's extremely important to me. Um, I'm very sympathetic. We work with a lot of directors of sports science in the game, so we have to really care about the nitpicking of it, uh, but then the players don't necessarily care about the same level of reliability. So how do you balance that, right? And so your level of certainty on what you want to tell a player can be completely different than the level of certainty when you talk to, say, Bryson Nakamura, like the director of sports science for the Milwaukee Brewers. Like, he has a much different bar to clear, and you can have some uncertainty uh, without lying to, you know, the player. You, you don't want to tell him, like, oh, if you improve your curveball from this to this, and if we make these changes over the next six weeks and we spend the whole offseason doing this, you have, like, a 47% chance to have a higher, better curveball. Like, he doesn't want to hear that. Like, he just wants to hear, like, that there's a really, like, we should do this. Like, that's all he wants to hear. He doesn't want to hear probabilistic analysis. Um, and so it's interesting. You just have to have two, you have to have two vocabularies in this, in this business, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, Joe, you kind of hit on that with the defensive stats, too, right? Sure. It's, it's like you want to prove that this stuff understand right. that, that, that it works, and you have to test it, but it needs to be simple enough. Yeah, but I mean... But that is the trick to a certain degree, that what, what Kyle was just kind of talking about, is that, you know, from, a, from an analytical standpoint, a lot of times what we're trying to convey is the best approach, because more times uh, than not, it will be, you know, it'll, it'll lead to success. But that doesn't mean that in one particular instance, it's definitely going to work. I mean, you know, um, so, you know, we're, we're well known for our defense metrics and, and, and advocating for shifts and that kind of thing. And, and you see those situations where, uh, 
a team will shift and then you know a ball gets hit uh, through the hole that's left in the op uh, open on the other side and for a long time that was that was a problem and, and teams had to grapple with the fact that maybe their pitchers uh, didn't um, respond well to that kind of thing and you know should they be shifting or should they not behind certain pitchers just because of their mental uh, sort of state and being able to, to process that and I think you know that seems to be something that again that now that this stuff is becoming more and more prevalent uh, and, and it's being used more at the at, at lower levels such that they get used to it such that by the time that they're at the major league level you know I forget who it was was kind of making this example yesterday that at this point um, maybe it was Eduardo Perez that, that they've uh, that big leaguers and pitchers are able to shake that stuff off a little more easily than, than they used to be able to. So, as somebody who's in Dan, I mean, we're, listen, we're a long way from Mike Fitzgerald starting to travel with the Pirates, right? Like, this is, what, five years ago, and, and you know, kind of getting that information in there. So, like, what if, as, if, if you were to suggest to somebody who's in the data field to try and be able to, to communicate with field staff to players, what would you suggest that they do? Is it just as simple as spend a lot of time around them and listen to try and find the language that works, or is there something more specific that you would say? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you, uh, you definitely want to start from a standpoint of, uh, you, know, you know, potentially even sort of uh, selecting the person in your organization that, that can kind of convey, like start by speaking from a language that's familiar to them, you know, in, in baseball mm -hmm. terms that, um, that you're not coming at them straight with the math and like start with the baseball terms and kind of like work the, the, the mathematical concepts into to that such that it, that it makes sense. But then, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, again, the, 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 I don't know that I have a great answer for, you know, because sometimes it's, just, it's time. It's, it, you need to be able to essentially convince somebody to, to have a certain amount of patience that like, again, this is going to be something that um, has, uh, will work out you know, in the aggregate, um, but you're going to have those certain uh, certain instances where it doesn't, and you're just going to have to to work through those. Be patient, let it let it let it do its thing, and and again, that sometimes just sort of takes a uh, just some time for, for for people to to kind of absorb. One of the other things that we're seeing as a change, at least closer to the field level is in game planning on both the offensive and the defensive side. Many more personnel, a lot of times former pitchers in an organization that helped to game plan for the pitching staff. Teams are adding now what, what are in essence offensive coordinators behind the scenes, right, that are trying to take the information and break it down. Mike, as you look at that and how that's changing, what's the way to keep that information flowing to players so that they're able to use it? And I, and I think I'd like to focus a little bit on the offensive side with this because I think that's where we're trying to, like you know, the pitching side, it seemed the, the data, the tech, the way you go about using the, the more advanced heat maps and advanced scouting reports probably has changed more than the hitting to this point, but like what's the way to go about it? What's the way to be able to communicate that idea? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing you need to do is have someone who can do two things, right? Who is able to actually communicate that, but also comes from a place that the players will respect, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to be able to walk into a locker room and tell a guy this is how you're supposed to do it. And that's why you're seeing a lot of these hires being like, you know, some of these former players, backup catchers, who are suddenly going like right into this role. And it's cool because they can speak both parts of the language. And, you know, the players, I think, will give them the time of day, which has always been kind of an issue for some of this stuff. And so that's, I think you're really seeing those roles being filled, like, you know, we talked about Mike Fitzgerald, and obviously he did a great job, but and now I'm seeing more of, like, you know, the Dan Herons, and I'm on the pitching side, but pretty much every team is finding a guy like that, and the trick is finding those people who can come at it from both sides of the coin, and, you know, we're seeing more and more of those. That's the best way to do it. Kyle, as it, as it keeps going on the offensive side, I mean, I'm sure you've worked with some of these, these guys that have been put into these roles for the first time. Obviously, I mean, you've got, you know, one of your associates is now a hitting coordinator, right, for, for an entire major league organization. Like, how do you see that building out, and, and how do they get up to speed if they haven't necessarily been as immersed as somebody like, say, Jason had been in, in what the information is for game planning and for the, for the mechanical setups and changes the guys have? Yeah, a huge part of it is I think we lose the sight, the fact that baseball organizations, the best ones that are run like Houston and so forth are run like a business because it is a business. And some of the issue, you can't just, everyone has a job, so you can't dump a ton of technology on people and expect them to learn it because they already work 60 to 80 hours a week on their current job. And so, like, for example, um, with Jason and a ton of organizations, this is not to single out the Phillies, but, like, Jason will have, like, he had something like five text threads, five group text threads going with, like, 150 texts a night in him. And it's just, like, 
that's you wouldn't run Microsoft that way. Like we would use like HipChat or Slack or whatever. Like at, at Driveline, we use Slack and Basecamp, and we're very like religious about using some sort of like organizational theory. So a lot of it is just all this data has to go somewhere and be analyzed and checked. But in my experience, the players and in the Phillies' experience, the players are, are I love it because they're like, hey, we have better like better aggregate data on, they don't even use that, those terms, they just say like we have better outcomes, like how I can tell if I'm getting better when I do practice planning, is this practice affecting me, how is it making me better, uh, it, what's the reliability. There's all these things baked into it that you don't have to use those words, but they really understand. Um, and starting from that perspective, as well as actually caring about the organizational theory and running it like a business and caring about communication, uh, those are the things that are the number one things that need to improve inside baseball, uh, which is just simply having more interdepartment communication. Right now, the medical side does their thing, and then the player development side does their thing, and then scouting does their thing, uh, ignoring the fact that like when you draft a player, he goes and gets coached. Like There's just very little communication between the two. Uh, at most organizations, and that's where generally all the things fail, including, and it's amplified by the fact that you're trying to roll out new technology initiatives. And that's where I see uh, the biggest roadblock being, is not technological or any uh, quantitative, it's just really old school, just communication. I, I think you hit on something that's really important in there. So is it incumbent on teams to find basically coordinators, like somebody that coordinates the efforts from scouting to development to medical to make sure that everybody is together on that? Yeah, that's and that's the thing. The word coordinator would seem to imply that that's exactly what's happening, but really what the coordinator role in baseball is, is the best coach, uh, the most technical coach and the person who knows the most and has put in the most time, and that's really not the role. Like a coordinator should go in, and Jason's expectations for him and from the Phillies is to go in and build a hitting system, and then if he does his job, he gets fired. You know, like that's the best, because he leaves it there, and that, that would be good for me. I would appreciate that. I would appreciate having my employee back. Um, but uh, that, like that's what a coordinator should do, is set up a, a durable system that when you have massive turnover like the Astros do, it doesn't cripple the organization, right? And that's, we will see if Houston has built that because they've had a ton of turnover for good reasons. Uh, but have they built a durable, like, anti-fragile system, if you want to use Taleb's term, like, on what actually matters? And that's what we're trying to do at Driveline. Now, that's kind of hit us pretty quickly, that we've lost a lot of employees, including Matt Daniels and a lot of other good ones. In fact, one who was supposed to be here is uh, in Tampa interviewing for a team that happens to be located there. And... Um, it's interesting. So, like, how do you build a system that is durable and will, will survive any one person getting hit by a bus slash quitting slash going somewhere else, which is basically, you know, when you go to pro ball, that's essentially what happens. So, like, how, how do you survive that? Well, Joe, you, you guys go through that at BIS all the time, right? So, like, what do you have with infrastructure that allows you to do that? And how much are the people the infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, a, Mike now works with somebody that used to be the president of our company, uh, Ben Jedlik, and you know he's uh, obviously the great work that he did for us is what uh, was made him as qualified as he is to to be sort of running the Stackhouse Data Quality Team. But um, yeah, I mean, with his leaving the organization, having been there for eight years up to that point, that was uh, a big adjustment that we had to make. And you know, I think at that point, um, you know, for us being or our being a, a small company, like you know, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, we never necessarily had to deal with um, uh, overly sort of corporatized, you know, mm -hmm. systems. But it was the kind of thing that, as you know, just because we had a certain amount of continuity of of, of the other individuals that had already been there for a while, that had uh, had um, you know sort of built up sort of even little strong uh, units within the organization, we were able to pick up that slack relatively well. But we we realized with Ben leaving that that was something that um, could be a very real sort of potentially. Uh, earth-shattering thing for the company. So at that point, that's where we started putting things in place that, you know, management tools and, um, and communication tools that, that actually would allow us to sort of communicate better uh, across the, the company such that, you know, if, if anything mm -hmm. similar to like would happen again, it would, the fabric of it wouldn't, wouldn't tear. You know, a lot of the things that, that are talked about, and, in, in, you know, Mike and Kyle have kind of both referenced player development now at this point, right? And and player development, medical, a lot of it has to come with baseline, right? Baseline on talent that's evaluated through scouting, baseline on and where a player's performance is, baseline on where they are medically. How important is it to get an understanding more of what the baseline is, even than what, say, the average is for players to understand where a player can go? Um, yeah, you want to, why don't you start? Yeah. I was going to say, like, I mean, you need to know where you are before you know like where you're going to go, right? If you don't know what a player's baseline of anything is, you know, spin rate, velocity, anything, how can you say if he's improved or declined? You know, and I think 
in the past, maybe you would had to maybe just use the eye test, the scouting report, saying, oh, he's got you know 60 this, 40 this, and they've actually got numbers. You know, you can actually go to a player with those actionable numbers and say, listen, because of this, this other guy with similar uh, you know attributes to you added four inches of drop on his curveball or whatever. And I think that's compelling. Like right there, that tells a big story without having to go too deep in all of this. But you got to know where you're starting from. If you've got a good curveball, a poor curveball, these are the numbers you start with. Yeah, and also player comps are obviously popular in scouting, but are also really popular with players. Players see themselves, um, everyone who's played backyard baseball or Little League grows up and, and fashions themselves as someone they watched. You know, like they loved it and they fell in love with it. Um, no one got into baseball to make a ton of money. Like that wasn't the reason anyone fell in love with the game, right? So speaking to a player and saying like these are the comps and having a good historical understanding of the game is, is, very, is vital to talk to not only players today who do care about that and have grown up playing games like Triple Play and the show, um, or, but also speaking to older coaches and having a respect for the game of, of the greatest players who played in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Like having understanding of that enables you to connect to both sides of it. And, um, and we found that just having comps and discussions um, is a great way to open up a dialogue before you start talking about numbers. Yeah. How, oh, go ahead. And I just wanted to add one quick thing because uh, I think this is actually potentially a good a piece of advice even for anybody out there that's, that's looking to become uh, in an analyst, work for a team, work for you know a uh, company um, like BIS or something like that, uh, is that context is really important. So it's it's not um, make sure anytime you're you're trying to uh, profess you know any sort of interesting data points about a, a given players or such, um, the the data about the players itself uh, isn't you know is fine and and uh, but isn't always enough. Like you want to always put the, it into context of what league average is or you know how that measures mm -hmm. up against other players and how you know how that that uh, right again basically that how how they're measuring up against um, everybody else in the league because context is what is ultimately you know meaningful how good or or not they are uh, relative to everybody else that's out there you know, competition wise. Yeah, two different things, right? So solving for baseline helps in the development of the player. Solving for average helps us with the understanding, right? Like it's nice when you hear things like exit velocity of 100 miles an hour and it actually works out that that's above average, right? Because it sounds like that it should be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? It's like, whew. Yeah. That, we, we admittedly did not do a great job of that, at least on the stack SI in the first year or two. And that's been like, you know, a huge part of everything we've done since. Like uh, there's some new, there's a whole like new television package of graphics that we're working on, like all of which will show you like visually this was good or bad. Like a lot of the stuff that, uh, Darren Woman's been working on the baseball savant is, you know, percentile based, right? This is, you know, 100th percentile, it's bright red. And just like at a glance, you can see if it's good or bad because a lot of these numbers, if you don't know what the context mm -hmm. is, you have no idea what a 2200 spin rate means. And a lot of fans are never gonna care about that. But if you say, this is the best or this is the second percentile, that's a lot easier to get that point across. So how do you, how do you create round numbers out of things that aren't round numbers. You know what I mean, if that yeah. makes sense? So like round numbers are easy well, for us to understand, right? That's one of the reasons why they were, why 3,000 hits, 500 home runs, right? They're easy milestones. But like how do you make something that is not a round number a round number for, for understanding? Well, sometimes you don't. You know, some, <laughs> sometimes you can't. Well, okay, think about spin rate, right? Like yeah. it's a four digit number. The last two of those digits probably don't matter all that much, right? Like you could say, oh, over 2,600 is a high spin. Maybe it's actually like 2612. Nobody cares about that. It doesn't matter, especially not like on television or, or you know, in an article. So, you know, I don't want to say you fudge it, but you do what you need to do to get the point across in a way that people can understand. And, you know, it's a little different from what Kyle was talking about where you're, you're talking to, you know, uh, R&D guys at the team, and they really do need to know to that, like, right. you know, fourth decimal point or whatever. And that, I think that's where our different audiences kind of serve us differently. I'm trying to connect with a general audience, a TV audience, and you are speaking directly to, like, the super nerds who oh. are trying to improve guys. It's a little different. Okay, but to, to fall on that, Kyle, like, do you need, if, you're, if you've got a coach that calls you and is asking it, are you giving him 2612 for the spin rate, or are you talking into more general terms? Or are you just saying this guy's got great late life on his fastball? Yeah. I usually, uh, my, my background is kind of everyone assumes, and I'm not saying wrongly, that I'm a, a massive nerd and got into the, as I wear a Commodore 64 shirt, uh, <laughs> uh, like, 
uh, my, my first job was as a scout, uh, was coming up through the traditional scouting um, path, to be honest, uh, in organized baseball anyway. And so um, the beauty of Branch Rickey's system, the beauty of, of 2080, is that it's actually you know three standard deviations, and it's a very rigorous statistical test, and scouts just don't even know that it has that big of a thing. So um, I, I use the 2080 scouting scale for guys. It's like, oh, yeah, spin rate, and it's above average, and what does that mean? right? So we could just use the 2080 scale, which I think is extremely uh, elegant from that regard. Uh, and then also the rate plus stats, I think, are really good. And something they can grasp, um, because when you say, like, the person has 112 WRC plus, like, that doesn't really mean a lot. But you can just explain that very simply. Like, the person has 12% 12 uh, 12 um, offensive uh, production above average, you know, in the league average, right? And so the rate plus stats are extremely uh, easy and intuitive way to describe someone's performance uh, to someone who may not know a lot about stats. Um, but uh, as long as you word it correctly. I always worry with that because I use the plus stats a lot because I, I, I agree with you. I think it's something that's easy or in concept to understand. But like where does, where is that delineation? Is it 15% before you're really talking about a plus player, a, a 60 player in, in, in scouting parlance versus this guy's above average or this guy, you know, we say 100 is average, but clearly there's fudge bars on either side of right. that, right? Like it's, I think Fangrass did a nice job of this in their, their, um, their prospect series this year when they kind of said, okay, like we know that a two-win player is an average player, but really it's kind of like 1.6 to like 2.3. Like that's where your fudge factor is. So like how do you, sorry, I think I'm talking to a microphone before, but uh, <laughs> so how do you try and make those delineations for people to have a simple understanding of this guy's actually, like 10% better than league average is actually like really, really good or 15% is like really, really good. Yeah, for me, I'm just, it's, it's on us to know the uncertainty and it's on us to know the statistical validity and then, um, like, we should be the bearer, we should be responsible for all of that to make sure that it's legitimate and then we should give it to the people who are less, like, lower information using a scouting scale or something that they already understand. So they don't need to know what the uncertainty around certain things is or what, like, 10% is necessarily. Uh, but, like, for, like, fastball velocity, it's obviously not 10%. It's somewhere between 1% and 4% is statistically significant, right, in the bands for fastball velocity. So they all get it, right? They all know that, but it's just about talking like, oh, it's a 65 fastball. To him, he knows exactly what the band for a 65 fastball is, even though he may not know exactly what the miles per hour are. And, well, I was going to say a simple way to do that sometimes is, is you know, and this isn't necessarily going to work in a blanket way, but like, like uh, you know, the way that Kyle was sort of referring to the, the scouting scale kind of being on X number of standard deviations. I mean, that would be sort of a, a simple approach to that, where like, you know, if 100 is average, like where you're starting to get to, to you know, um, to plus and plus plus and, mm -hmm. and, and elite like might be a, you know one standard deviation two standard deviations three standard deviations and you don't necessarily want to you know say that on air because people aren't even necessarily going right. to understand what that means but like if you've already beforehand sort of set those kind of benchmarks for yourself looked at the league and found found those benchmarks then you can kind of take those numbers and uh, and use those as, as, as what you I, sort of go from. I wanted to kind of follow on that in, in going back to the round numbers with like something like defensive run saved, right? And so like when you're looking at that where seemingly every run matters in terms of that, like how do you how do you balance that to make an understanding of what the difference between somebody who's plus three and plus five is and where those right. big the where those deviations become so, standard deviations. So become. I mean DRS um, you know is something that's based in yeah it's a uh, it's a you know, average league average is zero, so it, it's 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 not like a a, a metric that's um, that you're sort of starting from ground zero and, and working your way up. It's it's one that's centered at zero, um, and it's always sort of relative to league average. Now, in terms of saying you know what's elite, what's uh, plus, um, you know, to a certain degree, that's something that uh, we just sort of report the numbers and, and kind of leave it to, uh, to, to people to, to sort of, you know, interpolate for themselves because it's, um, it does vary from year to year. I mean, the things that, that, that is that you'll, you'll know anything that ends up being above 20 is, is, is that's where you're going right. to find your elite players. And, uh, you know, we can sort of say that every year, but, um, we, we honestly, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, this, as a as a question, we've never actually been asked that. Uh, it, mm -hmm. I think most of the time, it's it's something that people can see the numbers, and you know, it's it's relatively evident in the in the scale, like who's who the actual like really elite players are from it. 
I, I guess, and, and this kind of goes back to something that Kyle brought up earlier in terms of like, you know, okay, so the player doesn't necessarily need to know the minutia, right? They don't need to know, they just need, they want to know how it works. Like, do we get taught, caught too much in the minutia of, of some of the information we give, whether it's, you know, whether it's data tracked or technologically tracked? Is it just enough to say, hey, we see improvement here? Or is it enough to say, well, we see this specific level of improvement here? It sort of depends, I think, on the on the situation. Like, you want to be able to back up what you're saying. Like, you can't just say, oh, this guy's better because I say so. You know, like, you got to be able to explain a little bit, you know, here's the outcome number, uh, whether it's movement or, or batting average or however you're going to do it. Uh, but here's the reason why. And I think you still need to dig into that. Now, obviously, if you're doing, let's like a, a television broadcast, you may not have a great deal of time. So you just, people sort of need to take it on faith. Uh, but I think if you're writing an in-depth article or if you're working with a player in person, you really do need to be able to back that up in some way, even if you're not trying to go so deep that you completely lose the person. Uh, we've got some questions here. I'm going to start with this one because this was interesting and, and, um, and an interesting comment. John Lester, the, the Cubs pitcher, uh, was talking about um, while he appreciated new technology, he's more of a feel guy and doesn't use the tech as much maybe as other players, at least as we, we, he said now as, as he's going through bullpen sessions. Um, and I guess it's probably, uh, you know, Kyle, we'll start with you on this, but how do you go about addressing players who may, uh, may not have fully embraced the technological movement while showing them that they can improve as a player but also not wanting to lose that feel element that players feel like is so important? Yeah, it's, uh, it's important to realize that their experiences are real to them, at least, and that's uh, the most important part we need to start with. So whether it's, you can't fit like, you know, a square peg into a round hole just because like, Lesnar's also accomplished a lot in his career. So trying to tell him what the deal is, is, is kind of difficult. Um, also having some minimum competent, like standard across the organization, you also can't let one person, and I'm not saying John's this way, but you can't let one person hold up quantitative analysis across the board. And um, I think the veteran players, if approached correctly, understand that that, that delineation. You know, it's for some people, uh, especially, and it's not for some others. So just having uh, some baseline respect for what they've accomplished uh, and then trying to kind of go into it. And like we were talking at the beginning of the panel, just saying like, well, John, this is what you do really well, and this is why you do it really well. And based on these scores, like this is it. And if that resonates with him, awesome. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. Uh, but in reality, like the best time that those veterans who are not that interested in this type of information are going to be most receptive is when they're bad. And that's what we've seen. Like there's a lot of people who are just not that interested in like getting better or like learning about quantitative side of it until they have no answers anymore. Like they've done everything the coaches have told them and it's very uh, nonspecific and they don't get much better. And why is that the case? And so then, then they're a little bit more open minded. And that's the case kind of for for everyone. Right. Like anyone in this life who is like over 28 pretty much has a fixed mindset in a lot of things. And so until something challenges their worldview or until something disrupts it, they're not gonna be really open to that. And just understanding that you like have to have that, that, unre that respect and that understanding of humanity. Um, like you don't wanna force anything, whether it's stats, technology, or anything on someone uh, until they're ready to hear it. Yeah, I would also say that the ultimate analytical tool is the human brain. I mean, we're always taking in information and processing it and making decisions based off of that. So. Just because somebody isn't necessarily using um, numbers to net make a decision doesn't mean that they're not making the right decisions because of the way that they process information. Um, so not to say, obviously, you know, the human brain is, is, is fallible, but like it's not impossible that there are certain players that, you know, their feel really just means that they're processing information in an analytical way that has allowed them to be successful because they've figured out little things that, that make them successful. Uh, next question, the sabermetric ev evaluation of players gave way to scientific player development. What's the next step in the data-based evolution of the sport? Injury prevention, I guess. Like, that's the nut. Hasn't Everybody that been the answer there. for 20 years? I know, but it's, it's still <laughs> true, right? I mean, Tommy Johns are down, I think, yeah. so maybe we're making some progress there. I, it's, it's not something that I'm aware anybody is close to doing, but, I mean, that has to be the next thing, right, is, you know, we've found the good players. We're improving them. I gotta keep them healthy. Yeah, I think uh, in, obviously injury prevention is something that we deal with a lot. We see our sample is highly biased towards injured players compared to the norms. Um, but then also, I, I would challenge the idea that we like have found all the good players because there's no, there's just no way that baseball players. This is may, this may sound like heresy, but there's no way that baseball pitchers are the best throwers of objects in this on this planet Earth. It's not true, right? There's javelin, there's javelin athletes, there's elite cross sport athletes that we could probably attract more to baseball that would do an incredible job. 
Um, and that's something that like I think would do, uh, there's also international spending, international uh, recruitment that I think could go a lot better. Uh, initiatives in baseball that I've been involved with in Europe uncovers quite a few number of players. The war stories about Max Kepler and things like that show great promise across this. And the NBA has really embraced that, whether it's uh, introduction to Europe and Vladi Divac and those players and then China. Uh, and MLB is starting to make inroads in non-Latin American countries, and there's a ton of great base, ton of great athletes, and a ton of great throwers um, in Europe. Handball is a very huge sport. Why can't some of the handball players? If you've seen the German handball team, they look enormous. They're all six eight, 250 pounds, and incredibly fast, right? And they make nothing, right? So like those, th those are great areas that I think we could do much, much non-traditional scouting uh, is available, I believe, to our game, and is starting to be uncovered by some teams. Yeah, I mean, well. Uh it's, it's interesting that sort of injuries were brought up because that's something that we have been trying to database ourselves. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot to, to mm -hmm. try to figure out, especially like, you know, even right now we're working on ways to, um, to add and tweak and add certain levels of, of complexity to it because um, it, there's so many things that are interrelated that uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to do, but I think, that's where we're pouring a lot of our uh, efforts into right now to be able to try to um, provide that in a in a way that's going to be potentially useful, digestible, et cetera, um, uh, because of how potentially important it could be. Yeah, I think I think you see that the teams. And so I'll, I'll use this as an example. I was in the Angels camp yesterday for Sirius, and we were talking to Billy Epler a little bit about this and some of what they're doing in terms of just trying to have an understanding of. Um, where guys are physically, you know, like how'd you sleep last night? What did you eat? You know, trying to track that kind of stuff. And then beyond it, something as simple, and he cited this one specifically, is the medical team watching how Albert Pujols, who has a myriad of leg problems, right, reacts to being on the field at first base for 140 to 160 pitches a night, and how each little step, each little pre-pitch step ha works, kind of evaluating that is, is really interesting when you start talking about some of the minutia that, that teams are looking at to try and evaluate that process. But I'm, I'm fascinated too, Kyle, by what you talked about and the idea of expanding internationally and how we get more of the best, we talk about how baseball doesn't get enough of the best athletes domestically, right? So how can we, if we get the best athletes internationally or more of the good athletes internationally, does that all of a sudden open the door for more domestic great athletes to fall because they see what these players can do? Yeah, I believe so. I believe there's a lot of there's a lot of non-traditional paths too, including inside Latin American countries. And we saw it, and very few people have talked, like Framber Valdez for the Houston Astros, signed at seven years, seven years older than your average Dominican prospect in, in the DR. Like that's unheard of that someone would sign. Like most people sign at 16 years old there, and he signed at like 23, I believe, and was in the big leagues not much later than that. Like those are the types, there's a ton of uncovered talent in, still in the Dominican Republic. Um, I was fortunate enough to go this past off season uh, and see just tons and tons of 18 year olds who just happened to hit puberty at 18 and not 16 mm -hmm. who will never play baseball because they overlooked because the current system is just let's attract 14 to 16 year old kids, no different than how we do college scholarships here in America and like put them in that system. And then there's uh, European academies are underfunded despite the fact that we have great athletes there uh, and other non-traditional Southern American countries I think are really good finds. Plus our inroads to China and Korea have been fairly slight for MLB. So I think that there's a ton, a ton of interesting talent um, that I think diversity grows the game in so many different ways, not just in um, not just in gender and race and what it looks like, which I think is really important, but also when you have diversity, you have diversity of uh, thought and diversity of path, which I think is extremely important because players can have the same output, whether it's, or people can have the same output, whether it's a business or a sports organization, um, and then it doesn't matter until there's conflict and until there's competition. And when there's competition or conflict, diversity is really important because it helps move the ball forward because everyone has different thought process on how they get there. So to answer your question more directly, I think it would really open up the domestic market to see just a much greater share, uh, a more diverse share of people in the game, uh, both in the front office and on the field. I, I, and I think specifically with the player, I mean, you talk about internationally, right? Scouts always love the multi-sport athlete, right? In the amateur draft, that's one of the things that they love. They love a guy that plays a couple of different sports, we become much more homogenous when it comes to sports in the U.S. and that, um, you know, elite travel sport, whether it be baseball or basketball or whatever it is, it's not, or hockey, 
it's not just limited to one sport, and the, the, the business that that has become has limited that. That idea of being able to go internationally and find somebody who maybe played another sport, yeah, I think the handball ex example is a good one, or basketball, or soccer, or whatever it is, um, you, know, you lead to multi-sport athletes internationally, might also you know, find you some better players, people who have better feel for how to play, play a game, let alone the, the, the game of baseball specifically. So, um, You mentioned how fans care less about, quote, X spin rate and more about percentile slash rankings. How do you think this sort of information can be best communicated to players in terms of player development? Yep, the first thing I would do, I think, if I was trying to uh, help a player, there was this great Twitter thought, I think it might have actually been from one of your guys, uh, showing Dan Altavilla and his slider last year just getting like pounded around the park. It's a flat, kind of crappy slider. And then he's out there this year, you know, after doing like a lot of this work, and he throws this ridiculous slider that basically like goes through the legs of a hitter and he corks screws himself into the ground. It's like that's <laughs> right away, there's no numbers right there, right? That's just like, look at what this guy did and that's not repeatable for everyone, certainly. It's not ever one size fits all. Uh, but I think that's where I'd start. Like you just start with, here's what this sort of stuff can do. And if you're really, really interested in knowing like the in-depth numbers, like certainly we can take you through that. But if you're not, well, let's just work on see how we can help you to improve. And I think that would be super effective just doing it kind of that way. Uh, what's the state of foreign baseball, let's say in Japan, Korea, uh, mostly in, on the Pacific Rim, in, in adopting technology? Uh, it's behind, but not that much. Like in Japan, TrackMan is installed in all but one stadium. Uh, the team that doesn't have it installed won the championship, so that's a little, <laughs> little frustrating. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you have players like Yusei Kikuchi, who came over uh, and is on the Mariners now, uh, has an entire team of analysts that he employs uh, to help with uh, TrackMan analysis. Uh, he has his own tunneling tools. We met with him at the winter meetings, and it was extremely impressive. He has a biomechanist um, that he consults with all the time. Um, and so then that, so individual players are definitely cognizant to it, um, but the traditional, in this, uh, the, the traditional nature of the game in Japan is stronger than it is here. So to break those bonds, it becomes more difficult. But with every Yusei who does different things, um, you know, the, the more valuable it gets, and, uh, or the more open it gets. And the value of just installing a single Trackman unit or Rapsodo or Kinetrax or whatever in an area that doesn't have it, it engenders a huge amount of competitive advantage. So you're going to see expansion considerably. We've already seen it at the junior college level. Uh, there's various junior colleges who have poor, poor funding, terrible funding, uh, that have Trackman units up. And then when asked, how did you afford a thirty to $50,000 Trackman unit, uh, the coaches don't say where it comes from, but it's clear that teams are funding Trackman installations into junior colleges, and there's no reason that can't happen in Brazil, uh, Czech Republic, and a bunch of other places uh, to uncover a significant amount of talent, which to me is the, is the reason that the Moneyball story was so cool. The quantitative analysis part of it was interesting as an economist, but like I just kept reading the Scott Hatterberg chapter and just couldn't stop thinking about how many undervalued players there were, and that's a great human story um, across the world that we can, we can start engaging. Yeah, what's interesting though is that within, within Japan, I think it's like slightly uh, kind of reversed than what it has been here, where the technology is what's leading things there. Like they're mm. they're spending a lot on technology, but the in terms of that finding its way to the field, like you you know you still don't see them using infield shifts that that very often. You still uh, don't see them making. They're they're starting to play around with lineup a little bit, but there's still teams that are very much sort of entrenched in the idea that you know, the, the first guy's got to be fast, the second guy's got to be able to bunt, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think the, the, you know, sort of the translation to, to some of the actual practices that happen on the field are, are, is what's sort of lagging there um, uh, relative to, to what's happening. No, that's here. interesting. I mean, you, you think about it here, you, how many people do you talk to say, well, see, they don't shift in Japan because those guys use the whole field, right? They don't realize that, what is it, 75% of all ground balls are to the pull side, right? So it's really hard to hit a ground the other way. Um, all right, one more here, and, and, and then we have to uh, wrap this. Uh, how is the new technology being used to help teams take advantage of and measure their park effects? Park effects. Um. And I, I guess this probably plays maybe less into park effects as we think of them in, um, you know, trying to evaluate for, you know, what, what is a good hitter park, but maybe in terms of how they are able to take advantage of their home field advantage. Right. Well, we were interestingly uh, meeting with a, a team recently that um, was sort of uh, kind of positing in, in their head that it's possible that, like, Playing outfield in their in their stadium is more difficult because the wind is is much stronger and and at times there than other places and wondering whether that was something that uh, could um, 
could be measured and, and somehow built into to the metrics or something like that. And obviously that's not something that we we can currently do, but if that if that were the kind of thing, like whether you're sort of being able to, you know, whether the technology can sort of map the field in, in more specific and, and detailed ways, whether they, it can start picking up potentially um, atmospheric effects that might uh, have have an impact on uh, um, on the way that the ball travels or the way that the players can do things, you know, that might be something that, that uh, it could have an effect on going forward. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm aware of at least one story of a hitter who wanted to know kind of like a granular breakdown of all the different slices of his outfield, of his home outfield, because he was gonna more or less try to aim there. You know, because it's not always as simple as right down the line, depending on how the ballpark's put together, and, you know, the atmosphere. And I, and I thought that was kind of cool. It's like, that is, I'm not sure he can actually do that. I'm not sure he's good enough to like, put it in exactly that spot <laughs> in the air, but it's cool that he's thinking that way. Yeah. And that's kind of a, like a, a different way to go about it than in the past. Yeah, we, we worked with a big leaguer who, uh, after like, putting a blast motion sensor on the bat and say like, here's, and hit tracks and doing our full hitting assessment, saying like, you do these things really well, these are the things you don't do well, this is your home park and you're unlikely to be traded because you're pre-arbitration, right? So like, uh, and he doesn't play for the Mariners. So uh, like a lot of it is, figuring out where, um, like, if this is really good and this is also suited to the park, like, you have to make a choice. Do you want to bolster your strength or do you want to kind of shore up a weakness which is also not going to play well in the park you're at? And so it's really interesting for players to, like, consider that the park that they're in, especially for the hitters, not so much the pitchers, um, on how they can do a lot, a lot better. Or on the pitching side, to kind of move on that side, there are, like, if you play in Oakland or whatever, you may be able to tolerate fly ball contact significantly better because the, the rate of foul ground is so much higher in Oakland than it is anywhere else. Plus, the park is also not hitter friendly. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things I think you can adjust for um, and get factored in. And while it's not a major decision, it's definitely, you know, it can be statistically significant um, at, as a tiebreaker in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's, I'm always curious about that with players. So like, so like, I think Andrew McCutcheon's a good example of that, right? Like this guy's used right center field over the course of his career and probably to not very good effect over the course of his career in Pittsburgh, with, with, as big as it is, and then in San Francisco and even at Yankee Stadium. I mean, it gets big to right center field. Now you send him to Philadelphia. Do you see a power uptick from him, at least in terms of home runs at, at home? because it plays a little bit more uh, hitter-friendly <laughs> at Citizens Bank Francisco than not, anyway. right? Like, like how, can you, how can you factor that in where you find a swing or players whose swings are better tailored for your ballpark than maybe the, than maybe the someplace else? So, um, although I do like the idea of you guys employing a staff meteorologist now to track StatCast data, Mike. I think that'd be great. So, uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Kyle Bodie, Mike Petriello, Joe Rosales. Thank you.